Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and as usual I start with announcements and it is holiday season and we are making cookies in the kitchen every day. We have beautiful cookie boxes, two varieties, well three or four varieties available depending on what you choose but one is gingerbread biscotti. Um, every day I pray that all the gingerbread biscotti get shipped out so there aren't laying, any of them laying around because with the building smelling like gingerbread it's very hard to not go back and sample the cookies. And then we have other no-bake cookies and macaroon type cookies and, and beautiful boxes with holiday labels and you know we can include gift cards if you want and ship them any place in the world. So that's where I'm doing a lot of my holiday shopping. And of course you can buy gift certificates for tuition to the school, for certification courses, for membership, for product that we offer here anything so if you're needing to do some holiday shopping I've always said it's better to give people the gift of health than a lot of other things that you might consider buying um, the second thing is until the end of the year we have some great certification specials that allow you to save up to like $1,800 if you buy a package and uh, winter semester starts in January so Believe it or not, it is already time to start registering for classes that we're going to offer in 2017. So if you're interested in any of those things, email me at pampopper at msn.com. You're also welcome to call the office. We have friendly people here. We're here 12 hours a day at 614-841-7700 and the office staff is also happy to help you. All right, today we're going to talk about iodine and thyroid function. Lots of misunderstandings about this topic. So let's just start with we need iodine. It's essential for the production of thyroid hormones, including T3 and T4, which influence the development and function of almost all organs in the body. The thyroid is very, very important. The body regulates iodine levels. So when iodine levels drop too much, TSH levels, thyroid stimulating hormone levels increase, and they can continue to do so until until the thyroid actually increases in size, we call that a goiter. When iodine levels are too high, the body makes adjustments in order to keep the thyroid from becoming flooded with iodine. Uh, this is called the wolf checkoff effect, and in people with normal and well-functioning thyroid glands, it prevents the thyroid from producing massive amounts of thyroid hormone and prevents the onset of hyper or hypothyroidism. Now, if this iodine um, exposure or intake remains abnormally high for a very sustained period of time, some susceptible people can develop hypo or hyperthyroid. We'll talk about how that happens in just a couple minutes here. Now, many doctors and laypersons assume that lots of people are at risk for iodine deficiency, but the reality is that people take in a lot more iodine than most people would assume to be the case. Um, of course, this is part of a bigger uh, issue where the assumption is everybody is suffering from deficiency disease, and my gosh, we live in a country where the problem is excess, not deficiency. Well, anyway, where is all this iodine coming from? Well, it's in iodized salt, and it's also in processed foods that are that uh, list as one of the ingredients iodized salt. It's in medications. It's in foods in which iodine is used as a preservative. It's in um, x-ray contrast media material. So for most people, this exposure doesn't really cause a problem, but in people who already have thyroid disease or are at risk of thyroid disease, this exposure can result in hypothyroidism and sometimes even thyroid toxicosis, which can be life-threatening. Now, just by way of example, 10% of the population of the Hokkaido Islands in Japan at one time experienced iodine-induced goiter because they consumed lots of seaweed, especially kelp, which is really high in iodine. So the kelp that the uh, Japanese were consuming resulted in iodine intake several thousand times the amount needed for daily function. Subsequently, restriction of seaweed and kelp lowered iodine intake and then reduced goiter in the area. But the prevalence of non autoimmune hypothyroidism remains at 9.7% and researchers have determined that this prevalence is proportionate to the amount of iodine intake. When iodine was restricted, TSH levels returned to normal for patients who tested negative for antithyroid antibodies, but for those who tested positive, TSH levels remained high. So it's not always fixable when you reduce the iodine intake. Well, the background on this situation, this fascination with iodine and how we got to be taking in so much of it, is in 1990, universal iodize, um, salt iodization uh, was recommended as a strategy for eliminating iodine deficiency in goiter. But by 2001, the World Health Organization and many other agencies were warning that consumption of iodine above safe levels by certain susceptible people could lead to iodine-induced hyper- and hypothyroidism. Well, this predict prediction proved to 
to be really true. The use of iodized salt is increasing around the world and with it a corresponding increase in particularly hypothyroidism. A study in India compared subjects with and without hypothyroidism and found that increased intake of iodized salt was a major risk factor for hypothyroidism. The same phenomenon has been observed in other countries like in China and in Slovakia. Another source of iodine is prescription drugs. For example, a common drug prescribed to treat heart arrhythmias contains iodine, and patients who take it have an increased risk of developing both hypo and hyperthyroidism as a result. Now, more research is needed, but it does appear that normal people generally don't have problems if they take in too much iodine. The problem is that people who do not have normal thyroid function or are at high risk for developing thyroid disorders do. And these are the people who are often given supplemental iodine as part of a quote unquote treatment plan for their thyroid condition. So just a couple of them that I'll mention to you. Dr. David Brownstein is the author of a book called Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. He says that it's a myth that taking supplemental iodine worsens thyroid health and insists that people don't consume enough daily, even those who consume copious amounts of iodized salt. His recommendation is between 60 and 50 milligrams per day, thousands of times the amount needed to induce hypothyroidism in the studies that I've cited earlier in this paper. Brownstein also claims that iodine deficiency is associated with other conditions such as autism, ADHD. He has a whole list on his website. Another alternative medicine doctor, Jacob Teitelbaum, also claims that people are iodine deficient, and this, is not, this not only contributes to thyroid disease, but he also claims that it contributes to breast cancer, breast tenderness, and fibrocystic breast disease. He also prescribes large doses of um, iodine, uh, between 6.25 and 12.5 milligrams a day, not quite so wild as, Teitelbaum, as Brownstein, but still several thousand times the amount needed daily for thyroid function. Dr. Mercola, who operates one of the most well-visited websites in the medical field, states that government guidelines for iodine are in inadequate. To his credit, he recommends against the massive doses of iodine that alternative doctors like the two I just mentioned tend to recommend, but um, nonetheless, his website could easily lead somebody to believe that everybody's deficient and everybody should start taking some, which could very easily lead to excess iodine intake. And even at lower intake, you don't have to consume wildly high amounts of this to have a problem. Iodine can lead to health issues. When patients with TPO antibodies but who had not yet developed hypothyroidism are given just 250 micrograms per day of iodine, 20% of them developed hypothyroidism even though their antibody counts didn't change. This is considerably lower than the dose that is being recommended by a lot of these alternative practitioners. As for the mechanism of action, it's not entirely understood, but current thinking is that when iodine exposure increases too much, the wolf take off effect is induced to clear iodine, which is eventually excreted through the kidneys. When high exposure continues, eventually this mechanism fails, TSH levels increase, thyroid hormone production increases, and thyroid uptake continues until the tissue is literally saturated, and that it's at this point that thyroid conditions begin to develop. If iodine exposure is reduced quickly enough, thyroid function recovers within a few weeks. The problem is the incompetent practitioners who are recommending these high doses of iodine are seeming to be completely unaware of the risks associated with taking supplemental iodine, so their patients continue to take it long past the time when their thyroid glands could recover. The bottom line is that more is not always better in the nutrition business, as you have heard me say on many, many occasions. And so while iodine deficiency is a health risk, so is iodine excess. And the problem is we have a bigger problem with excess than we do deficiency. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.